Honored guests, Professor Judith Butler. My name is Ola Melin, and I am director of the Nobel Museum. At last, we have the pleasure and the honor of being able to listen to you here in this room at the Old Stock Exchange, which has so kindly been provided for us for our use today by the Swedish Academy. And we are eager to listen undisturbed. So please, I would like to ask you all to switch off your cell phones and also not to use flash if you want to take photographs. A few years ago, the Nobel Museum first contacted you through our then head of research, Paul Sjöblom, and asked if you would be willing to come here to Stockholm and hold a Neil Wheeler Watson lecture. We are delighted that you accepted and you are now the seventh speaker in this lecture series by leading social scientists and those active in the humanities. The lecture series has been made possible by the generous donations of Neil Wheeler Watson. Thank you, Neil. Professor Judith Butler, you are Maxine Elliott Professor in Rhetoric and Comparative Literature at the University of California, Berkeley. You are best known to the majority of us for your groundbreaking work within the field of philosophy of gender, and you are one of the founding founders of what we today know as queer theory. You have argued that gender is socially constructed and thereby have adopted a position that could perhaps be described as ontological idealism. Among other subjects, in recent years, your writings have dealt with what I would like to call institutional violence. Osama bin Laden was li liquidated during the time I was reading your book, Frames of War, When is Life Grievable? And your thoughts concerning distinctions between different categories of human life as a precondition for warfare was suddenly very clearly illustrated in the, in the rhetoric from the United States representatives that followed. When I read your texts, and I don't think I'm alone in feeling that your texts at times demand a great deal of their reader, I am struck by something. I certainly perceive the influences of a long line of thinkers at times, your writing is even reminiscent of Plato and his idealism. You refer, refer to Hegel, German idealism's foremost representative, but that which strikes me is not the way in which you fall into the grooves of a particular philosophical tradition, but rather quite the contrary, the way you resist philosophical tradition and apply a philosophical approach to areas that have previously largely resided only on the peripheries of our Western minds. In doing so, you generate an awareness of questions that, while having been discussed by many others, are redirected in your work into the main currents of modern philosophy. This is not only intellectually stimulating, but also exceptionally impressive. That said, I realize that you haven't come here today to listen to my clumsy attempts to describe one of the greatest philosophers of our contemporary age. Professor Butler, today we are eager to hear your talk entitled Precarious Life, the Obligations of Proximity. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very honored and delighted to be here uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, and I, I want to thank the Nobel, Nobel Museum for their generosity and hospitality. Um, I'm hoping to offer you a set of thoughts on eth ethical obligations that are global in character and that emerge at a distance and also within relations of proximity. The two questions that concern me are at first quite different from one another. The first is whether any of us has the capacity or incl inclination to respond ethically to suffering at a distance and what makes that ethical encounter possible when it does take place. The second is what it means for our ethical obligations when we are up against another person or group find ourselves invariably joined to those we never chose. This happens at the border of several contested states, but also in various moments of geographical proximity. What we might call 
up againstness, the result of populations living in conditions of unwilled adjacency, the result of forced emigration, or the redrawings of the boundaries of a nation state. Of course, presumptions about farness and nearness are already there in most of the accounts of ethics that we know. There are communitarians who do not mind the local, provisional, and sometimes nationalist character of the communities to which they consider themselves ethically bound, and whose specific community norms are treated as ethically binding. They valorize nearness as a condition for encountering and knowing the other, and so tend to figure ethical relations as binding upon those whose face we can see, whose name we can know and pronounce, those we can already recognize and whose form and face is familiar. It is often assumed that proximity also imposes certain immediate demands for honoring principles of bodily integrity, nonviolence, and territorial or property rights claims. And yet it seems to me that something different is happening when one part of the globe rises up in moral outrage against actions and events that happen in another part of the globe, a form of moral outrage that does not depend upon a shared language or a common life grounded in physical proximity. In such cases, we are seeing and enacting the bonds of solidarity that emerge across space and time. Now these are times when, in spite of ourselves and quite apart from any intentional action, action of our own, we're nevertheless solicited by images of distant suffering in ways that compel our concern and move us to act, to voice our objection and register our resistance to such violence through political means. In this way, we might say that we do not merely or only receive information from the media from about faraway places on the basis of which we as individuals then decide to act or not to act. We do not only consume such information, we're not only paralyzed by the surfeit of the images, sometimes, not all times, but sometimes the images that are imposed upon us operate as an ethical solicitation. And I want for the moment to call attention to this formulation, since I'm trying to underscore that something sometimes impinges upon us at a distance without our being able to anticipate or prepare for it in advance. And this means that we are in such moments affronted by something beyond our will, not of our making, that comes to us from the outside as an imposition, but also as an ethical demand. I want to suggest that these are ethical obligations which do not quite require our consent, and neither are they the result of contracts or agreements into which any of us have deliberately entered. To make this view plain, I want to suggest as a point of departure that sometimes images and accounts of war suffering are a particular form of ethical solicitation, one that compels us to negotiate questions of proximity and distance. They do implicitly formulate ethical quandaries. Is what is happening so far away from me that I can bear no responsibility for it? Is what is happening so close to me that I cannot bear having to take responsibility for it? Is what is happening um, if I myself did not make what is happening, this suffering that is happening, am I still in some other sense responsible to it? How do we approach these questions? Although what I have to offer this afternoon and evening will not be focused on photographs or images, I want to suggest that the ethical solicitation that we encounter in, say, the photograph of war suffering, brings up larger questions about what ethical obligation is and how it is conveyed. After all, we do not always choose to see images of war or violence or death. They may appear on our screen, we may flash upon them or they may flash upon us as we walk down the street by the kiosks where newspapers are sold. 
We can click on a site as a deliberate act in order to get the news, but that does not mean that we are actually prepared for what we see or that we have really consented to see it. We understand what it means to be overloaded or overwhelmed with sensory images, but are we also ethically overwhelmed at such instances? And would it be a problem if we were not? I've made the point elsewhere that Susan Sontag considered that war photography overwhelms and paralyzes us at the same time. She thought we were paralyzed from acting, that we couldn't rely on those images to incite political mobilization, deliberation, resistance to the unjust character of state violence and war. But is it possible to be overwhelmed and unparalyzed? And can we understand this as the working of an ethical obligation upon our sensibilities? Must we, in fact, be overwhelmed to some degree in order to have a motivation for action? We only act when we're moved to act and we are moved by something that affects us from the outside, from elsewhere, from the lives of others, imposing a surfeit that we act from a surfeit that we act upon. According to such a view of ethical obligation, receptivity is not only a condition for action, but it is one of its constituent features. The media names any mode of presentation that relays to us some version of reality from the outside that impinges on us, making it possible to register a reality and so to be moved by it toward some responsive action. In this sense, ethical obligation imposes itself upon us without actually getting our consent in advance, suggesting that consent is not a sufficient condition for delimiting the global obligations which constitute our responsibility. My second point is that ethical obligations emerge not only in the context of established communities that are gathered within borders, speak the same language, and constitute a nation. Obligations to those who are far away as well as to those who are proximate cross linguistic and national boundaries. They are only possible by virtue of visual or linguistic translations. These confound any communitarian basis for delimiting the global obligations that we have. So neither consent nor communitarianism justify or delimit the range of obligations that I seek to address with you, address here today. I think this is probably an experience we have in relation to the media when it makes suffering at a distance suddenly proximate and makes what is proximate appear very far away. My own thesis is that the kind of ethical demands that emerge through the global circuits in these times depend on this reversibility of proximity and distance. Indeed, I want to suggest that certain bonds are actually wrought through this very reversibility between proximity and distance. If I'm only bound to those who are close to me, already familiar, then my ethics are invariably parochial, communitarian, and exclusionary. If I'm only bound to those who are human in the abstract, then I avert every effort to translate culturally between my own such situation and that of another. I circumvent the problem of translation for global responsibility. If I'm only bound to those who suffer at a distance, but never bound to those who are near me, then I evacuate my situation in an effort to secure the distance that allows me to entertain ethical feeling. But if ethical relations are mediated, and I use this Hegelian word with its resonance with media, if ethical relations are mediated, if they have to pass through some translation, pass through some presentation, then it follows, I think, that um, what is happening there also happens in some sense here. And if what is happening there depends on the event being registered in several elsewheres, then it would seem that the ethical claim of the event takes place 